thanks to the Libertarian Party and to Gregory for hosting tonight. And I'd especially like to thank Joe Kent, who really made this trip to Hawaii possible for me. And I've gotten to know Joe a little bit, um, mostly by email, but now in person over the last few months. And I have to say that he didn't, he didn't mention that his parents were going to be here tonight. So I feel a lot of added pressure as a result of that. But, but I assure you, but I think regardless of your particular uh, perspective on politics or economics, hopefully you can take something from my talk and learn something about how you approach economics in your own life. So first, we, we wanted to provide everybody with this chart. It's just sort of a family tree of economics. It's just interesting uh, historical information for people who are interested. Now, obviously, I'm a bit biased. The organization I represent uh, involves thinkers who are mostly down here in this area. And if you watch CNBC or, or listen to Janet Yellen or, uh, or Ben Bernanke, you'll find that most what they call mainstream economists today are somewhere down here, which means that they were loosely influenced by John Maynard Keynes, who, who became quite famous during the Great Depression, an English economist. And really his thinking sort of controls most of what's taught today as economics. Now, from my perspective, that's bad, that's a mistake, but nonetheless, that is, that is the reality. But really, until, until the Great Depression, from about the mid-1800s till about the 1930s, over here, the Austrian school, for lack of a better term, was really the mainstream. So this is a bit of interesting background, and there's a lot of overlap between these various thinkers. It's not rigid, and from my perspective, we shouldn't have rigid schools of thought. Milton Friedman, a name I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, he's famous for saying that there's no, there's no schools of thought in economics. There's only good and bad economics. I think that's absolutely true, and I think that's something we should keep in mind. But nonetheless, there's a very human tendency to want to create a framework around things and, and to categorize things. So I think this chart is helpful, and if you haven't studied economics, it's, it's kind of a, a fun thing, a, a fun place to start. So even though I'm in disagreement with the, the sort of the modern folks who would loosely find themselves over here, I will say this, at least they focus on something. Uh, because I, I very much believe that, that ignorance of economics is a very unhealthy state of affairs for America. And that, that's what leads me to my topic tonight, which is why any economics matters, regardless of your particular viewpoint. You know, economics is not really very popular in this country, even amongst libertarians. You know, there's sexier topics, right? There's things we'd rather talk about. And economics sounds kind of dry, it sounds kind of boring. And, and, and you know, if you look at Facebook, what do people post on Facebook? That tells you a lot about what they consider important. They, they post stuff about themselves or, or what they have for lunch, or they might post things about popular culture or even politics, but they don't tend to post stuff about economics. And I don't think that that's unhealthy, I think that's a sign that, hey, we're a, we're a pretty wealthy society. We're so wealthy, we can sit around all day and talk to each other on Facebook, not about the basics of food and shelter and clothing and, and hot and cold running water and the basic sustenance of life. We're so damn rich that we can you know, post a photo of what we had for lunch. So I don't, I don't want to give you an impression that, that uh, I think that the American public is somehow discredited because they don't spend their free time or their leisure time studying economics. I don't think that. I think that's probably the sign of a, of a relatively wealthy population. But the problem is, is that economics does matter. It matters very much, and we ignore it at our own peril. Economics is sort of like math or gravity or politics, right? And we may not understand it, we might not think about it very much, but it profoundly affects us, whether we like it or not. And when we talk about politics in this country, we tend to talk about it in the context, excuse me, when we talk about economics, we tend to talk about it in the context of politics. That's about the only time it really comes up. But the problem with politics is it lends itself to the sort of the blandest pronouncements, right? We get, we get platitudes in politics. We don't get specifics during political campaigns. And then, then when someone actually wins, it's all out the window. It's, but when they're running, they, they tend to talk about economics in these very ill-defined ways. They'll talk about the 1%, or they'll talk about inequality, 
and they'll talk about paying your fair share and all these sort of nebulous concepts, but we don't get down to a lot of nitty gritty. You know, once we understand that all human action is economic action, when we start to understand we can't escape or evade our responsibility to understand at least basic economics, I think we take a big step forward because to ignore economics or to think we can avoid it is to essentially avoid responsibility for our own lives. Now, we, we'd be very concerned, or we are very concerned, if 20-year-olds can't do basic algebra in college or if they can't read at a college level. Right? We'd be alarmed if our kids couldn't do the basic math required to understand if they were shortchanged at a cash register. But yet, we send young people out into the world far more susceptible to being cheated by politicians. You know, somehow we've come to believe that economics should be left to academics, policy wonks, people in Washington. And then worse yet, we don't protest when our kids grow up with little or no knowledge of economics. But it's okay to still have strong opinions about economics. We can certainly see that on Facebook. So ignorance of basic economics is so widespread. You know, you know I wish there was a pithy one-word expression we have. You know, we have the, the, uh, the term illiteracy, and we have the term innumeracy for people who don't know any math, but we don't have a, a nice, short, easy way to describe economic ignorance. But Murray Rothbard, who was a, a 20th century economist in the, in the Austrian tradition, he had a great saying. He says, it's no crime to be ignorant of economics, which is, after all, a specialized discipline, and it's one that most people consider to be a dismal science. But he follows up, he says, totally irresponsible, however, to have a loud and vociferous opinion on economic subjects while remaining in the state of ignorance. So sometimes when I, when I look at Facebook, I think, you know, social media is, is perfect. It's the perfect venue for loud, vociferous, uninformed opinions. I don't think it was made for it. And one place where you can really see this has been newsworthy in the last few months, is of course, in this minimum wage debate. Right? This, is, this is a hot topic in certain cities like Seattle. Uh, you know, wages are nothing more than prices. A wage is a price for your labor services. So when the price of something rises, the, the demand falls. Econ 101. When you raise the price of something, in this case, the price of cheap, unskilled labor, you have more unemployed people than you otherwise would. Okay, but what percentage of Americans have even seen a downward sloping demand chart in a high school or a college class? You know, with an X and Y axis, and we have, we have the price of something on one axis and supply on the other, and, and as the price goes up, the demand slopes downward. So you, you don't even hear this kind of basic uh, framework when people talk about the minimum wage. They tend to just talk about it emotionally. So it's this great, this widespread ignorance of economics that plagues so much of our political discourse. And it, it allows politicians in the political class to attack capitalism and to make demagogues out of entrepreneurial business people. It allows politicians to blame free markets for the very things that they or, the cent or their central bank caused. We're talking about things like the dot-com implosion, the early 2000s, the housing bubble, the crash of 2008. So in short, ignorance of economics allows some very big falsehoods to be accepted as fact by large numbers of people. And you know, this, this phenomenon is only gonna get worse as the 2016 election unfolds, right? But it's not so much that the candidates will focus on what I would call bad economics or the wrong economics, my fear is that they'll just sort of ignore economics, right? They'll pretend that economics doesn't exist. And that's really what campaigning is all about. You propose outlandish things that cannot exist, like greater prosperity without any corresponding increase in growth, in profits, in capital accumulation, in productivity. So they'll advocate things that only an economically illiterate audience would believe possible. That's kind of a big way of saying they'll propose a free lunch. And many, many people will fall for it every four years. So I call this the economics of the moment. And it's not listed on this chart. There's no school called the economics of the moment. But the economics of the moment is really the economics by default. When you don't understand or apply economics in your thinking, 
you get economics by default. It doesn't have any theories or any principles or any facts. It's just the political expediency of the moment. So the political expediency of the moment means to live for today at the expense of tomorrow. And in economics, the term for that is having a high time preference. A high time preference means you want some item so badly today that you'll put it on a credit card and pay 18% interest over a period of years to have that item today, and you'll end up paying double the cost of them. Well, that's called having a high time preference. Societies that have high time preferences tend to be not very prosperous societies. And societies that have the other end of that, low time preference, tend to be prosperous. P societies that put off consumption today for greater rewards tomorrow. So in politics, having high time preference means borrowing, spending, or inflating today to stave off a, a, a current economic crisis regardless of the consequences tomorrow. So you could call this buy now, pay later. And the problem is that the consequences often come after the offending politicians or the offending central bankers have left office. They're long gone. And we all know how notoriously short the average voter's attention span is. So the political class above all wants to be seen as doing something, right? Even when sometimes, or oftentimes, doing nothing is plainly the better course of action. But what's works is practicing this political expediency we call the economics of the moment almost invariably makes the current crisis worse, and it sets the stage for a more painful economic contraction down the road. And there's no question from my perspective that that's what happened with the great crash of 08 and the monetary inflation that's happened since. So instead of being allowed to pop, the bubbles continue to inflate. And money, capital, continues to blunder its way into unsustainable asset classes like, like the stock market today. And there's a term for this in Austrian economics. It's called malinvestment. And every round of malinvestment makes it that much harder to clear out the bad business decisions that are made during boom times and clear out the bad debt and redeploy capital to its best and highest uses. So when the bubble bursts, as it inevitably does after a boom, as happened most recently in 2008, you know, do we ever get remorse from politicians or central bankers? You know, do you ever hear a politician come on TV and say, oh, gee whiz, sorry about that. We were wrong. Might, might try voting for some other guys next time. No. And we, on the contrary, what do we get? We get finger pointing at everybody but themselves. We get the incriminations, and we get this scramble to appease an angry public. And so the whole cycle starts itself over again. So what we have to understand and be honest with ourselves about is that democracy encourages and rewards politicians who have high time preferences. So, so bad economics is oftentimes good politics. Bad economics is oftentimes the way to get yourself elected or reelected. And so this willful ignorance that we've developed as a country of economics, I, I think we can all agree, regardless of our political stripes, is very dangerous for our future. So then the question becomes, well, what can we do to correct this? How can we make economics more vital and, and less dismal and more relevant so that we're not this nation of gullible voters who fall prey to political nonsense? And how do we especially convince younger people that economics matters and has relevance in their life? Because after all, it's going to be the millennials who are quite literally paying the majority of the price for our decisions down the road. So while well, we think of economics, we have this, this strange tendency to think of economics as boring. Here's what Ludwig von Mises had to say about this in his, his, his big magnum opus, his 900-page human action. He said, economics must not be relegated to classrooms and statistical offices and must not be left to esoteric circles is the philosophy of human life and action and concerns everybody and everything it is the pith of civilization and of man's existence. Economics deals with society's fundamental problems. It concerns everyone and belongs to all. It is the main and proper study of every citizen. Pretty strong quote, not the kind of thing you're probably going to hear in your Econ 101 class at community college. But I really believe Mises was right. And I also believe that modern academia bears much of the blame 
we're sort of transforming economics from the study of philosophy and metaphysics into this highly specialized, hyper-technical, really a math-based discipline. So as a result of this transformation, those of us who are liberty-minded, we're constantly having to battle and oppose academia's self-serving agenda, right? Academia has a vested interest in making economics appear more complicated than it is. That's what academics do. And the media has a tendency to support this by sort of repeating their academic speak phraseology. So our job is always to demystify economics and make it more approachable for lay persons by treating it more like the social science it is, as a subset, really, of philosophy and logic, instead of treating it like calculus or math. And I will say this, we can learn a lot from our friends on the left, from progressives, when it comes to selling interest in free market economics. You know, progressives, they're never afraid to create vis visceral appeal, gut level appeal for their policies, right? People on the right and libertarians, we tend to always have this intellectual approach that requires sort of some steps. So from my perspective, you know, when it comes to economics, we can still be high-minded and appeal to reason, but in doing so, we can also appeal to the more emotional part of the brain. And that leads us to our other handout, something I'm sure most of you are familiar with, but we might benefit from thinking about econ more in terms of Maslow's famous hierarchy. Maslow was a, an American psychologist in the early part of the 20th century. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy, his, his categorization of human needs and the, the continuum that's represented by this triangle. Uh, and at the bottom of the pyramid are the most vital things we need like food and air and water and homeostasis, excretion, okay. Uh, but as we move up the pyramid, we get into uh, needs that are less immediate and, and a little bit more esoteric, like love, acceptance, intellectual stimulation. So we've allowed economics to be viewed as something that's too far up this pyramid. When in fact, Mises says economics is the very stuff of life. Economics should be viewed as something down here because economics directly affects the things down here. Our, our, you know, our, our under, underlying foundational material sustenance. That's what economics is. Uh, every human act, all the way from an individual stranded on an island in a Robinson Crusoe setting, all the way up to millions of individuals interacting in a, in a really highly interdependent complex place like Hong Kong. You know, all of these actions are economic at their core. And every human action involves scarcity, it involves choice, it has a consequence, it has a cost. I mean, even coming here tonight has a consequence and a cost for you. There, there are other things you could have done with your time. That's the trade-off. So economic choices are inescapable. And economic choices brought us up out of caves into skyscrapers, and, and unfortunately, they can take us back to caves. You know, it's really the sign of a rich society that we become almost oblivious to what provides us with food and water and shelter and clothing and running water, plumbing and energy, not to mention all the luxurious goods and services we take for granted, like this hotel and fancy cars and things that are beyond basic needs. It's really quite incredible if you think about it. And it's almost shameful to take that for granted, considering how, how many people in the world live with so much less. So when we view economics as the stuff of life, as philosophy, when we move it further down Maslow's pyramid, we begin to energize and humanize the subject. So to create a, a more visceral approach, to create a, a, a more of a sense of urgency about economics, especially young people, you know, we might begin by, by just asking people when we're out there trying to, to spread our message, we might start to ask them some really basic questions that are designed to create more of a visceral response rather than an intellectual response. So you might ask a young person some of these types of questions. You might say, you know, what kind of job and income do you realistically hope to obtain in your life? You know, do you expect to just be sort of, sort of a rock star living this multimillionaire lifestyle? You know, and, and if so, how is that going to come to pass? You might ask them, will you spend your adult life 
your entire adult life paying back college loans? Will you be able to get married and have children? That's a pretty astonishing question if you think about it. Our grandparents' generation certainly never questioned that. And here we are, supposedly richer, but we're questioning this. Will you have a lower standard of living than your parents? Now that's a distinctly American question because every generation in America has had a higher standard of living. And my, my fear is that the baby boomers represent peak prosperity in America. So that's a tidal wave. If for the first time in American history, the answer to that question is no, I, I won't have a higher standard of living than my parents. Will there be fewer and fewer jobs available? And will competition for those jobs be intense? Will your real inflation-adjusted wages and purchasing power decline during your lifetime? Medical care, will it get worse during your lifetime in terms of access and quality and cost? Will your standard of living decline significantly during old age? Another American question. Retirement is something we've come to take for granted in this country. Will you be able to leave an inheritance for your children? I mean, that's a primordial human instinct to build a nest and create something and leave it to your offspring. And finally, do you have any faith whatsoever that the people running the country, quote unquote, know any more than you do or care about you and your life at all? You know, when we go out and meet people and talk to friends and family and business associates and even strangers and try to promote liberty, you know, we have to ask the right questions. Because when we provoke a more visceral or gut reaction in people, we begin to connect with people intellectually by first appealing to their emotions. So with this in mind, you know, what can, what can the Austrian School of Economics help, help us? in terms of relating to people on a more fundamental or philosophical level. And what are some Austrian answers or approaches to some of these questions I've just asked? Well, let me give you a few examples. First and foremost, from the, from the perspective of, of Austrian ec economists, who are not monolithic, there's wide areas of disagreement within, within this particular school. But there's, there's widespread agreement on, on this first point, and that is first that property rights are the basis of prosperity in any civilization or society. Murray Rothbard wrote a very famous article in the 50s explaining how human rights are property rights. You know, just as we own our minds and our bodies, a concept we call self-ownership, we justly own the material products or results of our minds and bodies. And property rights, rights are a corollary of human rights and self-ownership. They necessarily follow. So it's no coincidence that relatively wealthy societies are founded on establishing the rule of law to protect property rights and to enforce contracts. And it's no coincidence that re relatively poor countries don't do that. There are countries in Africa that are desperately poor that are sitting on vast material mineral resources and the like. So poverty and prosperity depend more on the rule of law than they do the bounty of the particular geography. A second point that Austrian economics can, can add to the debate, current debate especially, is that booms and busts in the economy are not inevitable. They're not natural. They're not a built-in feature of capitalism or free markets. This is an enormous myth and an enormous falsehood. This seemingly mysterious cycle of, mon of economic expansion, like the 1920s and the Flappers and the Great Gatsby, followed by these terrible contractions, the Great Depression in the 30s and the Dust Bowl, this is completely understandable and predictable and explainable. Okay, Austrian business cycle theory enables us to take and unravel the official story about what causes these events, these booms and busts. You know, the Great Depression, the stagflation of the 1970s, for those who are old enough to recall that, the recession, the very deep recession of 1981, 82, 
Reagan was first in office, the tech stop bubble, the dot-com implosion of the 2000s, uh, the housing bubble in the mid-2000s, the stock market crash, the Lehman Brothers collapse of, of 2008, these are all predictable and explainable events. They're all explainable by Austrian business cycle theory. Now, Austrian business cycle theory is really just a theory that explains what happens when a government or a central bank imposes artificially low interest rates. Artificially low interest rates flow through the economy in a systemic way. And they, ca they cause banks and entrepreneurs to make bad business decisions, foolish business decisions about the future, which results in malinvestment, which can take decades to unwind. When we talk about malinvestment, we're talking about money flowing into something that it wouldn't flow into if interest rates were set by the marketplace. And one example of this that we talked about last night was the Cadillac Escalade. This was a very successful and popular vehicle during the boom times. It was a giant, luxurious SUV. $60,000, $80,000, very expensive vehicle. It was, very, it was favored by rappers, you know, and, and people who really wanted to have sort of an image. It's an eight-cylinder, sucked down a lot of gas, took huge parking space. Why was this vehicle so popular and sustainable? Well, when we had a gas price spike, and I know it's I know it's worse here, but when I was living in San Francisco at the time, the gas was 350. I'm flipping out, and this is a year or two before the crash. And the, and what happened was, the Cadillac Escalade became completely unsustainable. And once gas spiked, sales of the Escalade went down went down rapidly. And eventually, Cadillac discontinued the Escalade altogether. Fine, you think, well, that's Cadillac's loss. But here's the kicker, is Cadillac put tens of millions or maybe hundreds of millions of dollars into creating a production line. The Cadillac Escalade has certain size parameters, certain engines, certain doors, certain interior components. You can't just snap your fingers and take those tens of millions of dollars and say, oh, what the economy needs is not Cadillac Escalades. It's Samsung mobile devices. You know, that money's already been spent. It's already in, into equipment and machinery to build one thing. So all you can do is liquidate it, maybe even in a bankruptcy process. And there's tremendous loss there. Okay, that's malinvestment in a nutshell. So, so many ideas that look good on paper and make sense when the cost of borrowing money is cheap don't pan out. The M&A boom of the early 2000s is a good example of this. So when credit begins to contract and get more expensive as it must, the dislocations appear. And all those all M&A those ideas and all those public offerings with these private equity geniuses who thought they were the smartest guy in the room, dot-com startups, they're all exposed as unprofitable. So we need to debunk this idea, this terrible falsehood that capitalism is inherently prone to violent cycles when in fact, the cycles are caused by systemically low and artificial, meaning non-market, interest rates. So relating to interest rates, the third point I'd like to make to you from an Austrian perspective is that inflation is bad and it's caused by the Fed. Deflation is good and it's caused by the market. Don't let the talking heads on CNBC or or, or the financial shows confuse you. Inflation is bad and deflation is good. So understand that price inflation is a symptom of monetary expansion. Inflation occurs simply because the supply of goods, excuse me, the supply of money in the economy is growing faster than the supply of goods and services available. So inflation isn't always uniform across categories of goods. It may sort of happen in fits and starts. But you have to understand, inflation is engineered as an express policy of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve has something called the Fed Open Market Committee. And they have a, a written, it's available on the Fed's website, a written policy of targeting about 2% inflation a year. So inflation is not just like unemployment, a problem that we try to wrestle with. It's a policy of your government, the government that you pay for, an express policy. And of course, inflation doesn't make us richer. It can't make us richer. Expanding the money supply cannot make us richer. 
If tomorrow you create billions of new dollars, you haven't created any new Cadillac Escalades or Samsung phones or Dole Pineapples. You've created nothing but money. If you took the island of Hawaii as an example and gave everyone a million dollars tomorrow, and let's just say hypothetically that they could have, they, it was a closed universe, they had to spend it on Hawaii. They couldn't spend it anywhere else. There'd be no new goods and services on the island. Everyone would just have a million dollars more. They wouldn't be any richer. They'd all rush out to the Cadillac dealer to buy that house they've always wanted, but there'd be 10 other people in line. But the problem with inflation is the early recipients. Imagine if instead of giving everyone on the island of Hawaii a million dollars tomorrow, you said, well, we're gonna give everybody on the island a million dollars over the next several months. But a couple hundred people are gonna get it tomorrow and because they happen to be close to us, they're friends of ours. And then that process continues you know, slowly over time, more favored people get the money earlier, and then the least favored people, which tends to be retirees on a fixed income, by the way, they get that money last. Well, the 10 or 20 really favored people who got the money on day one before everyone else did, they really would be better off, right? They could go down to the Cadillac dealership and there'd be Cadillacs available and the price wouldn't have risen. They could say, hey, I'm gonna buy that. Or they could go buy that piece of oceanfront property that they've had their eye on but could never afford. So not only does inflation not create any new goods or services, it does create cronyism. And the early recipients of monetary expansion are often crony industries, like the defense industry, which is headquartered in Washington, D.C. So on the point of deflation, some of you may know the name Jim Grant, James Grant. He's on a lot of the talking head shows. He's uh, wrote for Barron's for many years, and now he has a, a publication called Grant's Interest Rate Observer. Well, he points out that deflation, which the Fed hates, the Fed has an express policy of 2% inflation every year. Deflation is just another word for getting richer. In other words, this is what's supposed to happen in productive societies. Prices are supposed to drop. Productive societies with sound money, things get cheaper. They become more readily available to average people. Okay, this is a benevolent phenomenon. You know, examples of deflation are all around us. Despite the Fed's best efforts, sometimes the market overrides. Look at personal computers. They had a personal computer in the 1980s with a, with a fraction of the computing power today cost three, four thousand dollars in 1980s money. Today, a, a tablet computer, it's far more powerful than you can purchase for $150. DVD players started out as expensive luxury items. Big screen TVs used to cost $2,000. Now you can get one at Walmart for 300 bucks. Laser eye surgery, not covered by insurance, of course. That's why it's getting better and cheaper. Laser eye surgery was something like $10,000 when it first came out. Now you can get $500 an eye. Okay, this is deflation. This is what's supposed to happen in a productive economy. More goods and services are available to you know, more regular and lower income people. Never let anyone tell you deflation is a bad thing. Fourth point from an Austrian perspective, bubbles. Bubbles can't last. Okay, that's why they call them bubbles. I mean, how many times have you heard someone bemoaning the idea that Wow, a one-bedroom tiny condo in Honolulu or in San Francisco costs a million bucks. You know, how can this be? Well, how it can be is this. Bubbles ex simply exist in those asset classes where the greatest amount of malinvestment occurred. Maybe that malinvestment money went into, into condos in Honolulu. Maybe it went into tech stocks, but it went somewhere. And the bubbleicious areas are the areas with the greatest malinvestment. So I, I don't know if anyone in this room has heard of Herbert Stein, but I bet some of you have heard of Ben Stein. Ben Stein's an actor. Um, he had a show for a while called Win Ben Stein's Money, I think it was Comedy Network or something like that. But he was also in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. So tell me, somebody in here has seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Well, so he's a teacher in that. So he's, that well, anyway, his dad was Herbert Stein, and his dad was an economist uh, in the Nixon administration. He was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, which is an advisory committee for the president, the sitting president. But really what they do is they kind of try to promote the president's economic policies, 
sort of a PR shop for the president's the cheerleading squad. So Herbert Stein, not as famous as his son, he came up with his own law. And that's the great thing about being an economist, right? You can have your own law. Um, and it's known as Stein's Law. Okay. So Stein's Law goes something like this. If something cannot go on forever, it will stop. Okay, well, I, I'm, a, I'm a lay person. I'm not a, a PhD economist. I'm not sure if any of you are, but I, it sounds simple. Right? He, he used it to describe economic trends. But it's a great tool to apply to determine whether a particular trend is really sustainable. If something can't go on forever, it will stop. You know, and so much of what we accept as normal in today's economy, the new normal, now that's a terrible phrase, isn't it? It falls apart when we apply something as simple as Stein's Law to, under, to better understand bubbles, government and central bank created bubbles. So I would suggest that some of these following things are bubbles, which means they cannot last. They don't pass the test of Stein's Law and that they're going to pop. First, an easy example would be the $18 trillion of federal debt we've got. When Reagan came into office in 1981, there was one trillion dollars debt, and he he called that an incomprehensible sum. When Bush the second W came into office in 2001, the federal debt was 5.5 trillion. Okay, and today it's 18 trillion. It's growing much faster than GDP. It's growing much faster than the productive output of our economy. This is absolutely unsustainable. And I will make add as an aside, as recently as 2001, when we had 5.5 trillion of debt, I think that there was still mathematically a chance to, to wrestle with our debt, wrestle with entitlements, and somehow find a way to pay off that 5.5 trillion. But what happened in 2001 in the, in the ensuing years? 9-11 happened, the government went crazy. Then the Medicare Part D prescription drug benefit was passed to help Bush beat Kerry by appealing to old people, frankly, and, and also by winning favor with the pharmaceutical companies who were the primary beneficiary. And then the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, so you take those three events, 9-11, Medicare Part D, and the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, and, and, and the rate of spending under both Bush and Obama accelerated so quickly that now we're beyond the curve. It's sort of like James Dean in a Porsche going around a curve with a cliff. You know, there's a point at which you can still apply the brakes and steer your way out of it. But there's a point at which, no matter what you do, you're going over the cliff. So that, the last point at which we could have not gone over the cliff was about 2001. So only 14 or 15 years ago, the American government was savable. The next bubble item I'd like to, to raise is quantitative easing. This is what the Fed does for a living these days. They've quadrupled the Fed's balance sheet since the great crash of 2008, from less than a trillion dollars to, uh, to about four trillion dollars. This is historically unprecedented. No central bank has ever done anything like this. Quantitative easing, it's one of those terms we don't really understand, and what does it mean? Well, basically what it means is that banks, in addition to making loans, sometimes they buy government treasury debt and they just hold it as an investment to make money, to get paid interest from Uncle Sam. So the Fed creates money in effect and it bought all those treasury bonds and continues to do that from commercial banks at a relentless pace after the crash of 2008. So the banks love this because they get their money back with some interest. And federal government loves it because what they can do is they can spend more than they take in in taxes and they can create bonds, treasury bonds, to pay for the rest. And then when the holders of those treasury bonds magically get paid off by the Fed creating money, you, what you've done is you've created a free money for Congress. It's circular and you have to follow a few steps, but you've made it possible for Congress to spend more each year than it takes in in taxes, to run deficits, issue bonds to cover the, the shortfall, and then have the Fed go buy those bonds later. Okay, this is, this is a great trick. I mean, God bless, if you, can, if you can get away with it, 
I mean, you, you can see why politicians jump on this, but it's completely unsustainable. It's a bubble. It cannot go on. People are simply not going to buy, buy treasury debt forever, especially Asian central banks are foreign creditors. It's a bubble. It can't go on. The Fed is coming to an end with quantitative easing. And then we're going to see what happens when money doesn't come out of thin air. Um, Dow Jones average, it's tripled, tripled since the low of 2009 after the crash. The equity markets have tripled since 2009. So where's the GDP? Where's the earning? Where, where's the new growth, the new markets for American products? Where's the productivity growth to support the stock market, equity market, tripling since 2009? What this is, is, is Fed created new money finding its way into the stock market. Okay, this is not organic or real growth. This is phony artificial growth. You know, I'm not a prognosticator. The timing of this is, is, is very difficult. And if you know how to time markets, you're a very rich person as a result. But it's a bubble and it can't last. The final example I'll give you of a bubble is, of course, housing prices. They went up and up and up relentlessly from about 2001 till about mid-2007, like nothing we've ever seen. Everybody's condo was just worth triple what they paid for it in a few short years. And then, of course, we had the crash. But now it's back. And it's especially back in places like Honolulu and San Francisco. And you have to wonder, you know, there is an element of supply and demand to housing. I don't deny that. People want to live in beautiful places like Honolulu and San Francisco. But the unsustainable rate of growth of housing prices is not simply supply and demand at work. This is another asset class that all that newly created Fed money is finding its way into. So beware with housing, just like the stock market. So finally, after bubbles, my last Austrian sounding point tonight is this, that we need a separation of money and state, okay? just like we need a separation of church and state. And unlike so many policy areas that are, it's just, it's so hard to grapple with, like social security, you know, how can we ever cut back when people are depending on it? And it's just, it's, it seems like this intractable problem politically. You know, money doesn't have to be that way. We could have a very simple political solution tomorrow. We could simply legalize competition in money. We could, we could let the Fed keep doing what it's doing. We could let the treasury keep producing dollars and people could use those dollars as they see fit but simply allow people to use other forms of payment in America. Simply allow people to use gold and silver as money, for example, if they care to. And the problem of dividing you know, an ounce of silver that's worth 1,200 bucks, you know, how, you know, dividing that to buy a loaf of bread, that's easily solvable now. We have e-gold, you can, you can create a debit card that just slices and dices that, that gold into as small a fraction as you need. Let the Fed's fiat dollar compete. It's just that simple. That's all it would take. Legalize competing currencies. And we would see very quickly whether the Fed's right or not. So in Austrian economics, money is just the most readily exchangeable commodity. It's a commodity. It's, it's just like iron or timber. It's a commodity. So when banks create money and credit, what ought to be a commodity provided by the market becomes this tool of central planners, right? The Fed ends up controlling half the economy, in effect. Right? Remember how it seemed evil and Orwellian when we talked about Soviet central planners, you know, with the former USSR. The, you know, Linoy Brezhnev. We had these images that there were these Politburo sitting around a table in Russia, deciding, you know, how how many bushels of wheat are we going to produce this year, and how much are we going to pay. You know, what's the, what's the monthly wage of an auto worker going to be? And we, you know, we say, oh my gosh, that's centralized planning. That's, that's evil. We're capitalists over here in America, right? We let the market do this stuff. Well, not with money we don't. Half of our economy is controlled by a centralized planner. The Russians have nothing on us. Okay, the Fed is the greatest centralized planner in history. I mean, it controls half of every transaction, right? When you go buy that Cadillac Escalade, what do you do? Well, you say, hey, I think I might want an Escalade. So talk to some other people about theirs. You go online and research it. Maybe you test drive it. You check out the quality of that product before you buy it. 
But who checks out the quality of the other half? What you're exchanging for it, US currency, dollars. Who checks that out? Well, you know, Honda could say, or excuse me, Cadillac could say, you know, we'd love to sell you this Escalade. Um, we're a little worried. A little worried about what the Fed's doing with these dollars. You, know, you, have, you have any gold? We prefer that. Well, that's not how it works. If with legal tender laws, they got to take the money. Now, they price risk into it if they're sensible, of course. You know, the inflation risk is priced into the cost of that Escalade, presumably. But we don't think about the quality of money. We think about the quality of a good or service that we're going to consume. But does the recipient, does the provider of that good and service, or, or service, think about the quality of the money they're getting? It seems like the answer is no. So the Fed is a price setter, just like the Soviet planners were when they were determining the price of a bushel of wheat. They're a price setter. Interest rates are nothing more than a price. And they should be represented by lenders and borrowers coming together, supply and demand. But when the Fed sets the price of something artificially low, it resonates throughout the whole economy. It's systemic. And this disconnect causes unbelievable distortions. We can't even begin to conceive of it. David Stockman, a name you might be familiar with, he says there's no honest pricing of goods anywhere. We have no idea what a bushel of wheat or a barrel of oil should really cost because the actions of central banks around the world, not just our own Satori, but central banks around the world, we have no idea what anything should cost. So when you effectively leave control over half the economy, the money half, to a handful of Fed governors, you can't say the result of that represents free market capitalism. On the contrary, it represents centralized planning of the worst form, the croniest form. So in closing, let me summarize that we don't have to abandon intellectual rigor to sell free markets. But we do have to make economics more relevant. We have to make it more visceral and vital to the average person. We do that by, by taking it away from academics and treating it more as a, as a philosophical matter that's, that's available to the average intelligent layperson. And we start asking the visceral questions, questions, you know, why are we so rich? And what if, what if it all went away? You know, now clearly there's some gloom and doom out there. We know that there's some very serious structural problems with our economy. It, you know, as I've discussed with the Fed and the dollar, entitlements, a whole other subject, debt. These are serious structural problems. But even so, our, our economic future is unwritten. Okay, the future is unwritten, and certainly as liberty-minded people, we believe that, if nothing else. You know, the biggest challenge is, is our mindset. You know, there's no reason on paper that America can't be and continue to be a very prosperous place. You know, despite all of our problems with, with American schools and universities, we still have one of the most educated workforces in the entire world. We have more land available to us than virtually any other country. Russia has more, but a lot of it's frozen. And we have this abundant, sparsely populated West. And, and in fact, 17% of all US acres can be farmed. Many, many hundreds of millions of acres can be farmed. We have 500 million acres of timber, more than we had during colonial times. We have these two huge coastlines that not only protect us from would-be invaders, but they also provide us access to both you know, the European market and to Asian marketplaces for our exports. We have huge amounts of cheap energy in the form of oil and natural gas. Uh, the Obama administration's interior secretary uh, re released information in 2013 that with the, the Bakken formations in the Dakotas, in Montana, we have double the amount of oil we thought we had. We have three times the amount of natural gas we thought we had. So my point is that we shouldn't start, we shouldn't let the government, or the Federal Reserve, or the political class eliminate our enthusiasm for the future. You know, our problems are of our own making. There's no reason on paper why America couldn't just walk away from the West, rest of the world in terms of prosperity. We still have the underlying fundamentals for a very healthy and sound economy. But we can't change it if we're ignorant of economics. So what I hope 
you take from this talk tonight is some enthusiasm for making economics a more vital subject, a subject that really affects our bottom line on a daily basis. So with that, thank you. Well, let's have another hand for Jeff Dice. I thought it was very important. We would like to invite you into the conversation. If you have questions for Jeff or if you have some comments you'd like to make, feel free and uh, uh, I can respond to some of them, but you want to hear mostly from Jeff tonight. Go ahead and raise your hand. We'd love to have you. Yes. You seem to have a pretty good crystal ball there. I'm just curious as to what you see happening as far as the federal debt is concerned. I mean, at 14 trillion today, what's the limitation where does it go? Does it go to 30 trillion? What happens at some point? I mean, what's what's your crystal ball as to what happens, what stops it, or what, you know, what's the future? Well, there's there's no question we'll, we will default. There's no question. Um, the, the question is a matter of how and when. Um, it's an absolutely bizarre situation because the rest of the world holds a lot of dollars, especially Asian central banks. And the rest, the rest of the world knows it's not in their long-term interest to keep financing our debt. Russia and Brazil and China and India, they know it's not in their long-term interest, but because they hold a lot of US dollars and because they hold a lot of US treasury debt, in their short-term interest, if those dollars went south quickly, they'd be left holding the bag. So we have this bizarre situation where their long-term interest is, is A, but their short-term interest is B. So the question is what makes us stop? And what's gonna make us stop is the rest of the world is just gonna say no mas. We're not buying any more of this basically what's junk bond, US Treasury debt, and we're not gonna keep funding your properties and so that you guys can spend more than you raise in taxes and have wars in the Middle East. You know, we're not gonna finance it. So that's, that's, that's what's gonna happen. So I'm a, German, I'm a German immigrant, I understand, I remember uh, the history of the hyperinflation that happened in the right. 30s in Germany. Is that right. one of the scenarios you're looking at? Or what, I don't know what triggers something like that, but. Well, we've never had, we've only had regional currencies go south rapidly. We have Argentina as the most recent example in the late 90s, obviously Weimar Germany. So we have never had a situation where a global reserve currency depreciates rapidly. So it would be absolutely unprecedented. And I mean, the good news is that you, know, you don't have to flee America because the rest of the world's gonna get the same flu. You know, so you don't have to move to Costa Rica. You can, you can stay right here. Um, there, there's a whole debate about whether a collapse takes the form of hyperinflationary spiral or actually a, a radically deflationary contraction. That's, you gotta ask somebody a higher pay grade because. Uh, I thought you're the highest they come. No, 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 no. I'm married. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty far down. Uh, but uh, that, that's, that's just a question that's, that's so hideously complex. And what's made it so complex is that the dollar is systemic around the world. Thank you very much. We have a question right here in the front. Yeah, is democracy compatible with sound economics? No, Dem democracy is one, of the, is, is one of the worst shams ever uh, perpetrated on the American people. The, the United the Constitution, you won't find the word democracy in the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a made up shibboleth, largely the 20th century. Um, th there are certainly democratic elements to our Constitution to our Bill of Rights, but there are there are expressly anti-democratic elements. The, the Electoral College is expressly anti-democratic. Why does Hawaii have two senators with a million and a half people? And California has two senators. That's not democratic, and it wasn't intended to be democratic. Uh, the, the, the First Amendment is inherently anti-democratic. If 99.9% .9 of people got together and voted that Nazis shouldn't be allowed to march in Skokie, Illinois, it wouldn't matter under our constitutional system that 0.001% could 
gets to have First Amendment protection so against a, an overwhelming majority. So there are majoritarian elements, but um, I, you know, democracy is incompat fundamentally incompatible with liberty, in, in my opinion. Okay, general question is might make crime rather than right make might crime. So it's very bad. Because the number of uh, people favorizing the way of thinking doesn't make it right, but might. Signs you might be in a bubble. Um, cupcake shops selling five dollar cupcakes. I mean, when we were kids, you, you know, your mom made the whole tray of like twelve of them, and it was just that plain cake, and slap some icing on top of it. Um, when you're using your credit card to buy five dollar cupcakes, I think that's I think that tells you that there's a bubble. <laughs> And one of the worst examples of that, I mean, the, one of the biggest bubble cities on earth is Washington, D.C. I mean, talk about artificial growth and the housing market in Washington, D.C. is crazy because there's all these $125,000 a year jobs. Um, you know, and so Washington, D.C. is full of these things called Georgetown cupcakes where people are standing in line around the block uh, to get gouged. So to me, that's... Well, the picture is called the entitlement gap. Uh, there's an economist at Princeton named Lawrence Kotlikoff, I hope I'm saying it right, and he basically took a, a basic finance approach of, of calculating the net present value of our future obligations, our future promises, and the net present value of our expected future tax receipts under even a rosy growth scenario. So our, 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 you know, our entitlement obligations are Social Security, Medicare, uh, Medicaid and also increasingly VA. There's a lot of young people who have come back from Iraq and Afghanistan to whom we promise lifetime medical care who have very expensive you know, health problems. Um, so you, you, you take all of our future entitlements and what they're projected to cost, promises, and you take all of our anticipated tax revenue and the difference between the two in net present terms is 220 trillion, according to Lawrence Kolokoff. So, you know, these are these are problems that um, we sh we had to be wrestling with decades ago to get out in front of. Remember when Ross Perot ran, and he had those he had those famous charts and graphs. And well, it turns out they were actually correct. Um, he was right. Uh, so it's 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 an unfathomable problem. So it's not the kind of problem we can sort of lay out a plan to address. So the question for me becomes: What changes things? Is it a, a really really painful economic calamity, or do we somehow, you know, see the train coming in the tunnel and and, and we we at least try to work it out? Um, a lot of people think it's going to take something very painful to sort of pull people out of their slumber. And, and I, I certainly, I have kids, I certainly hope that it doesn't take something painful. Any more questions? And Very good. And, but before you uh, ask the question, we've handed out a comment card to you. We'd love your comments and we'll pass on to Jeff uh, any thoughts you have, give him some praise, tell him what you thought about this evening. Uh, and any other questions. In addition, if you do give us your contact information, we'll make sure you, that we stay in touch with you as Grassroot Institute when we're, we are bringing resources like Jeff uh, around the islands and uh, we'll, we'll be in communication. Okay, questions. So please fill those cards out. Um, yeah, my question is, you know, that most economies are, are built on growth. 
um, in continual growth, and we live on a finite planet. And so I, I understand ex the, um, your school of economics is how to efficiently do, you know, allocate those resources best, but how do you as an economist reconcile the fact that you, on a finite planet, you can never, at some point, it's a bubble. You, you, we can't grow forever on a finite planet. Do you talk about that? Do you well, uh, I mean, that's absolutely true. I, I think that that ultimate question is a long way off. Um, but economics is all about creating efficiencies. I mean, we, we get far more yield per acre because of, of technological and economic efficiencies today than we did 100 or 150 years ago. Um, you know, desalinization is probably part of the future in terms of providing water for, for uh, you know, billions more people. Um, and and if, if the underlying resources to sustain an economy, you know, they, those may, might not be uh, fossil fuels, we'll, we'll find something else. And if we don't find something else rapidly enough, I think the, the uh, population will adjust itself. I mean, population growth or decline is a market phenomenon unto itself. So I think, I think we have to look at things and, and say, how can we make things better or, or you know, at least bad? I, I don't think we should look at things like that with a utopian vision. I think we should leave utopianism for, for the left. And just say we, you know, we approach these problems as humans have always done, um, by trying to solve them. But I think history shows that um, solving them locally and privately tends to work better than solving them centrally and governmentally. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to know what you think about taxes and how they relate to free markets and how they help or hurt. Well, I mean, taxes are an interesting question because if, if what the Fed is doing really worked, if the government could just issue treasury debt and people would buy it, and give, us that, give, us, give the government that money, and then later on the Fed could create new bank reserves and just buy them back, then we, we don't need taxes, right? We can fund the government strictly through treasury debt. I mean, if Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen are correct, then we don't need taxes. But Taxes have this funny way of sticking with us. Um, you know, I don't think uh, taxes are not going to be a hot issue in 2016. I don't think the two, the, the Coke and Pepsi parties, are going to offer anything that really changes the landscape. I mean, taxes to at this point, given the level of debt and given what I would see as a, as a, a lawless federal government, I would say taxes are more about control than revenue at this point. Uh, rewarding and punishing. Um, there are lots of people who benefit from having a Byzantine tax code because if your particular industry can effectively lobby and get, and, you know, seek a comparative advantage by, let's say, creating a tax credit for solar versus no tax credit for wind, um, you know, so tax, taxes at this point um, are about control. They're, they're not really about Well, I mean, optimism. Yeah, and and, and um, that that's that's a great question. Well, first of all, I apply Stein's law to the federal government. Something that cannot go on will not go on. So it won't go on, and that provides us with an opportunity. We can fall into an authoritarian abyss at that point, or we can find a, a decentralized, localized, freer way to arrange human affairs instead of having this this thing in Washington D.C. control. 320 million people. I mean, with interests as diverse. I mean, think think of the think of the social, cultural, political, economic interests in Honolulu as opposed to Des Moines, Iowa, as opposed to Juneau, Alaska, as opposed to Manhattan. It's it's absurd. It's an absurd way to organize human affairs. And if if the future, if the unsustainability of the federal government means that we that we sort of start to go our separate ways and solutions or approaches become more localized, then, then I'm all for that day. And the sooner it comes for my kids, the better. Um, if the unsustainability of the federal government means a, a horrific collapse, um, then I, I think we should 
we should work to, to make it otherwise. Well, I mean, let me just add, you know, let's not let's not be over dramatic here. It's like people, a lot of generations, even in modern history in America, have lived through a lot worse than we're living through. I mean, look at the people who, who look, look at the Civil War, look at the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression. I mean, we're all standing on the shoulders of our of our grandparents and great grandparents, all you know, who, who certainly had it much tougher than us on a material level. So. Um, if we if we succumb to fatalism or pessimism, then I, I would say we're doing a disservice to our grandparents and our great grandparents. They didn't go through everything they went through so that we could we could cry. Very good. What was question? What would happen if the Fed went away tomorrow? Well, if the Fed went away tomorrow, there would be general rejoicing throughout the land. <laughs> um, it'd kind of be like Christmas and your birthday and New Year's Eve. All no, um, if the Fed went away tomorrow, uh, markets would would rush in very quickly, um, and I think I think time honored methods of payment would uh, assert themselves quite rapidly. But in the meantime. Um, there's no reason we couldn't have a, there, there are places like Zimbabwe, um, formerly Rhodesia, where their central bank went kaput and they had hyperinflation and they couldn't print, they had hundred million dollar notes and this sort of thing. And now uh, Zimbabwe's central bank is defunct and they exist in this interesting state where in Zimbabwe um, merchants accept multiple currencies and they're very quick and facile in their minds with converting. So if you go to Zimbabwe and, and deal with a street vendor, you might use Euro, you might use Swiss franc, you might use Bitcoin, you might use US dollars, you might use yen or an NIMBY. Um, and they've just decided to sort of let the market place work out what's the best. But what's, what, what form money would take and what's the best form money? Those are really questions for the market to decide. It's an empirical question. What makes the best money? Well, thank you. Yeah. You know, be before you run off here, how many of you got value out of tonight hearing Jeff? Terrific. Could a few of you just uh, mention uh, as, 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 just what you got out of Jeff's talk real quickly, what you really thought was great to hear? Thank you. Education. Thank you, sir. Oh, all right. You know, that's incredible. We have an open bar in the back. There you go. <laughs> Very good. Anyone else? He says depression, so here I... I, 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 I ruined his evening. What, what stood out, perhaps, in what Jeff said tonight? Any thought or idea? Yes. Uh, the value or the, the lack of value of our fiat currency. Now. All right. Yeah, that's a great insight. How about you? That we really have no idea what the value of things are because it's been so obscured. That's a great thought. Any other thoughts stand out to you tonight? Yes. Just <clears throat> on perspective, just a little bit of history with a little bit of, you know, looking at things from the outside in as opposed to the inside out. That's, That's great. I like that perspective. I got that too. Yes, sir. Truth. Say that again. Truth. Truth. How about that? Truth. All right. Terrific, terrific. Anything else? Well, I'm going to let you talk to Jeff now, and, and uh, we want to thank you very much on behalf of the Grassroot Institute. We want to serve you and uh, do a lot more that's coming here on this island. Uh, last year, we were able to expand from Oahu to the, the island of Maui. We were, we were very involved in helping to get Maui's hospital converted into a public-private partnership so that it's no longer gonna be run by the unions and instead private companies can bid now for doing something that the government is incompetent in doing. Would you like us to come and try to help you do that with your state hospital here? So that's what we're gonna be working on on the big island as well. So stay in touch, do fill out the cards, give us your comments and your information and do come up and meet Jeff. And I wanna thank all of you this evening for being with us, Libertarian Party, wish you the very best. Good night and give another hand to Jeff, thank you.